it's a great honor to have a uh, today to have Professor uh, J.S. Jenkins and to give us a talk on green uh, electricity uh, from a government policy point of view. And uh, Professor J.S. Jenkins is a rising star in the area of green electricity. He's a assistant professor at Princeton University with a joint appointment in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and also Anning Center for Energy and Environment. And uh, he also has a courtesy appointment at School of Public and International Affairs and High Meadows Environmental Institute at Princeton University. He's a macro scale energy system engineer with a focus on rapidly evolving electricity sectors and particularly uh, involving transition to zero carbon resources. And uh, Professor Jenkins is a very active and uh, in research, and he often give that uh, uh, testimony in front of uh, a Senate floor and advising government what is that the pathway for uh, green electricity. And his publication also attracts a lot of attention and often highlight in on what, what times, uh, on Wall Street journals, and, uh, and many other and uh, news reporters. I think today there we are very happy uh, to hear that what is his view in terms of uh, uh, zero carbon energy, and hopefully combustion can contribute a lot and to uh, to pursue that zero carbon uh, energy uh, sustainability. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse. The floor is yours. Hey, Yiguan, um, thanks for inviting me to, to speak with all of you today. I appreciate the invitation and it's, um, it's good to meet at least visually through or virtually through a Zoom, many of you today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, one of the sort of two main areas or I guess three main areas of research in my laboratory, um, which is focused on using macro scale energy system models as basically as test beds to try to evaluate the design, um, the sort of space of design options or what we call the design space. Um, or the range of cost or performance parameters that future low carbon energy technologies um, may be able to achieve uh, with the right uh, application of innovation, research, and, and funding uh, to improve their performance or cost along certain dimensions. Uh, so we use these models of the sort of future energy system uh, to try to evaluate what uh, efforts today might uh, want to prioritize in terms of innovation, uh, research, and, and investment in novel technologies. Um, this is one of the areas of work in our lab, and I thought it might touch closest to, um, you know, the work that, that you all do in the combustion community. Um, and I'll we're going to focus on, a, on an energy storage example as the case study here, a long duration energy storage um, study that was just accepted in Nature Energy um, as an example of how we use these methods to evaluate novel technologies. Um, we're also doing similar work, uh, as I'll mention at the end, on, um, on carbon capture and sequestration uh, design options for flexible operation in natural gas power plants. We're looking at fu future commercial fusion energy designs um, and flexible operation of geothermal electricity systems as well. So a whole range of different technologies that we're evaluating with this sort of suite of tools to try to provide um, insight to funding agencies to, like uh, Department of Energy's ARPA-E, um, Geothermal Technology Office, uh, and private sector investors in, in research and innovation as well, like Breakthrough Energy Ventures and others um, as to where they might want to focus their efforts, as well as individual companies um, and researchers who are trying to develop these technologies. So just a little bit about my lab. Um, I run um, a group we call the, Z the Zero Lab for Zero Carbon Energy Systems Research and Optimization Laboratory. And our focus is really on improving real world decision making uh, in order to accelerate rapid, affordable and effective transitions to a net zero carbon energy system. Um, by net zero carbon, we mean that an energy system that emits no more CO2 into the atmosphere every year than we uh, absorb through human means, whether that's uh, protection and enhancement of land carbon sinks in agriculture or forestry, uh, or mechanical means uh, like uh, direct air capture or bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, which can take more CO2 out of the atmosphere and permanently store it um, in geologic uh, sources. So if we're going to try to stop global warming, we need to reach net zero globally. Um, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, from human society. And until we get there, we're gonna to continue to build up um, CO2 in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases and continue to drive climate change and global warming with substantial consequences for human society. So our focus is on trying to accelerate that transition to a net zero carbon energy system by um, providing practical guidance from our research for decision makers um, in various contexts. 
So we have three main research programs in our group. Um, I focus on macro scale energy system models, which I'll explain in a minute, but that basically means regional and national scale energy systems. And we use mostly optimization based methods to develop models that capture key um, economic and engineering uh, considerations and constraints that describe those systems and allow us to capture their um, complex interactions across uh, large scales and scopes. Um, and so we're developing methods to improve those tools, to expand their capabilities, um, and to provide um, more insight going forward. And then we use those tools uh, and methods primarily for two different things. Um, one is evaluating and optimizing low carbon energy technologies, which will be the focus of the talk today. Um, and then the other area is providing practical guidance to particular regional jurisdictions or national, national jurisdictions on what energy system transitions will look like in that particular context. So on Tuesday next week, uh, we'll be re releasing a report um, that I've been working on along with um, Eric Larson and Chris Gregg from the Anlinger Center for Energy and Environment at Princeton, um, uh, along with a, a, a large team of postdoctoral researchers and outside collaborators called the Net Zero America Project, um, which provides a, really a, a comprehensive look at what it would take to transition the whole US economy uh, to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So that's one example of the type of work we're doing here. We're, we're also doing other studies that are focused on particular jurisdictions or regions of the electricity sector in the US, including the Western interconnection uh, in the Western states and um, the PJM interconnection, which is here in New Jersey and the mid-Atlantic states um, out through Ohio, Illinois, and, and other um, states in the, in the Midwest. So that's the kind of work we do in our, our, the third branch of our research. And really uh, both of these areas are designed to, to provide insights for decision makers and policy makers, uh, just with a little bit different context. So, you know, the optimization Evaluation of technologies is meant to sort of aid decision making on uh, technology priorities and innovation um, and the energy system transition studies are meant to really inform policy and stakeholder discussions about the kinds of trade offs and considerations we need to be thinking about as we try to transform the way we make and use energy at a regional or national scale. So I, as you mentioned in the introduction, I consider myself a macro scale energy systems engineer. And I'm one of a growing community of, of increasingly focused community um, of macro energy systems researchers. Um, most recently, uh, I helped with a steering committee organizing workshop of this uh, kind of burgeoning macro energy systems community, um, which is a collection of researchers that are really focused on these large scales. Um, so sort of national scales, uh, long term planning horizons, uh, complex interactions between multiple energy systems which require a certain set of toolkits to try to understand and study these systems. So there's some commonality in the methods that we use um, and in the domain that we focus on um, revolving around the, the complex in interactions and transformations of energy systems at, at large scales. And so uh, if you head out, if you're curious and learning more about the macro energy systems community, uh, this link here uh, goes to a uh, webinar or a seminar at, um, at Stanford. Um, virtually at Stanford that we hosted um, a couple months ago, uh, describing our efforts to sort of build a broader and, and more coherent research community around this macro energy systems uh, field. Um, and, and that's been going really well. We had a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of participation at, that, uh, at a workshop that preceded this uh, seminar um, and a lot of interest from, from students and faculty in um, trying to create a bit more of a coherent research community um, around these topics because our as a primarily interdisciplinary topic, um, you know, researchers end up in multiple different departments and attend different communities and uh, publish in different journals. And so uh, we're trying to sort of create a little bit more of a center of gravity in the academic community around macro energy systems. So if you're curious and learning more, um, check out this link here for, for a nice uh, video of, a, of a about an hour long discussion we had at the um, Stanford Energy Seminar earlier this year. So you want to mention my focus is primarily on the electricity sector. I don't exclusively study electricity. Our Net Zero America study really looks at the whole economy. Um, but my focus in, in our lab is primarily on looking at the role of clean electricity and the transition towards a 100% clean electricity system, which is increasingly the policy commitments that states and utilities have been making uh, across the United States. Um, over half of US electricity is now uh, sold in jurisdictions or utility districts um, the territories that have committed either in state law or in utility commitments to providing 100% clean electricity um, sometime over the next couple of decades. So this is a transformation that's underway um, and is a, a big part of my focus. And that's largely because if we look at what it would take to transform the overall economy to net zero greenhouse gas emissions, study after study identifies expanding the role of electricity and decarbonizing or cleaning up the supply of electricity as the linchpin 
in any net zero economy. So it's not the only thing we need to do, but like any linchpin, if you take it out, um, the wheel falls apart, right? That's the sort of metaphor of the linchpin. Um, and so it's a critical component of any transition to a net zero emissions economy. And over the next decade, at least, it largely is gonna be the focus of most of our investment um, and policy effort over the next 10 years is gonna be in expanding clean electricity and, um, and expanding electrification of end use uh, and energy activities like electric vehicles uh, and heat pumps and buildings for heating and cooling uh, and certain industrial processes. So this chart is um, taken from data from our Net Zero America study. This is um, our pathways towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions across the economy and a focus on what the electricity sector has to look like to get there. So the bars here show um, to start with in 2019, our uh, current electricity supply mix. Uh, we provide about 4,000 terawatt hours of electricity from US generation. And about 60% of that is from fossil fuels today from combustion of coal and black and uh, gas in natural gas and red. And about 40% of our electricity comes from uh, currently from carbon free electricity sources. About half of that nuclear and orange and the other half a mix of renewable resources, including hydropower and blue, and then primarily wind in, as part of the green here, but this green bar includes wind, solar, geothermal, and biomass. So if we go forward in time, um, we can count on some of this existing infrastructure to stick around if we keep in refurbishing it, um, but we're also gonna need to rapidly reduce emissions from the power sector, and that means phasing out coal-fired power uh, uh, generation in the United States, at least by 2030, um, across most of the, or really all of the scenarios that we modeled uh, for net zero. So that black bar goes away by 2030. And we also need to steadily reduce the amount of natural gas that we burn in the power sector. Even if we keep some of the capacity around for these natural gas plants, we can just use them less frequently, um, that we're gonna have to start reducing their contribution to energy generation over time. If we assume we can keep about half of the nuclear fleet running to 80 years, then that, that's sort of the orange bar here, which will gradually shrink as our current existing nuclear power fleet ages over time. And we refurbish and keep about half of it under this assumption. Um, uh, so we have to see a shrinking role or from our existing nuclear fleet, but it doesn't go away. And then let's assume we can keep all the existing renewables around um, with the right investment through 2050. So then the gap between the bar here and these lines, which represent the growth in electricity demand in our scenarios, driven primarily by the electrification of transportation, heating, and industrial activities, um, leads to a gap. And that gap is the total amount of new clean electricity or carbon-free electricity generation that we have to bring online each decade going forward to 2050. Um, and what we can see here is that if you compare the total amount of clean electricity generation we have today to this gap in 2030, the gap in 2030 actually exceeds total generation from clean sources. So by, over the next decade, we have to more than double our supply of clean electricity. And because the existing nuclear power fleet is not going to expand, existing hydropower is probably not going to expand over that time frame. Mostly that means a growth in wind and solar power. So this green, green slice here, which has to be more than fourfold increased um, by 2030 in order to, to meet that uh, demand for new clean electricity. So a 4x growth of about 600 gigawatts of new wind and solar capacity that might have to be brought online over the next decade. We have about 100 gigawatts of wind for context and about 30 gigawatts of solar at utility scale in the US today. So this is a big expansion, but that's just the beginning because by 2050, if we can compare the gap here, it's about double all current US electricity generation. We need about 8,000 terawatt hours of new carbon free generation from uh, of various sources, which is double our current supply from all electricity sources. In other words, it took us about 100 to 150 years to build our current electricity system in the United States, all the generation we have online today. And we basically need to build all of that again twice over the next 30 years. So over the next 15 years, let's build everything we have got uh, again and then do it again over the next 15 uh, after that. So this is a huge undertaking um, and requires a substantial effort from public policy, from investment, from innovation uh, to find cost effective ways to reach 100% carbon free electricity and to expand the role of electricity in our economy in order to um, help decarbonize other sectors for which we have less um, readily available or less affordable low carbon substitutes like liquid fuels. So it's much more difficult to decarbonize liquid fuels uh, than it is to find sources of carbon free electricity. So the more we can electrify transportation, the more we can electrify heating, uh, the less we have to find ways to um, produce zero carbon uh, liquid and gaseous fuels, which are more challenging. So this is the electricity sector challenge. 
The good news is that wind and solar power and batteries, lithium ion batteries, have plummeted in cost over the last decade, which makes this transition much more plausible and much more affordable than it would have been if we had studied this question just five or 10 years ago. So in the last decade alone, we've seen basically a 90% decline in the cost of electricity from utility scale solar photovoltaics, a 70% decline from uh, uh, the cost of electricity from onshore wind power, and about a 90% decline in the lithium ion battery pack costs on the right hand axis here. So the cost of a lithium ion battery, which is the major component of a uh, cost for an electric vehicle, as well as a, a growingly an increasingly attractive option for grid scale energy storage in power systems also. Um, you know, so these are just dramatic transformations in cost over the last decade on the order of, you know, basically an order of magnitude decline in the cost of electricity and, and battery packs. And that's why these technologies are likely to be the centerpiece or the star of the show over the next decade as we scale up these affordable and rapidly uh, and and um, uh, and mature technologies that are ready for rapid deployment. We've seen a little bit of um, exuberance around these comparisons, where we see people comparing uh, the cost of wind and solar power, which are down here. Um, to all other generation sources, this is natural gas combined cycle, new combined cycle power plants, um, geothermal, coal, and nuclear power, which has been you know, increasing in cost in recent years. Um, and basically saying, you know, since these are the cheapest forms of energy we have, we're sort of done, right? Um, you know, we, we can just take, let the market take over from here and assume that wind and solar are going to outcompete all the other options um, as the cheapest sources of electricity we can turn to. And in some markets, if these were perfect substitutes, that would be an appropriate comparison. But unfortunately, when it comes to electricity systems, cost is only part of the story. And I like to explain this using an analogy. Um, if you're trying to decide what to eat and you're trying to decide between eating a banana and a burger, knowing that a banana is cheaper than a burger is part of the information you wanna know, right? That's helpful. It's good to know a banana is cheaper and burgers are more expensive. But clearly you're not only gonna eat bananas just because they're cheaper than burgers, right? you're gonna want a balanced diet of different types of foods. And in fact, the first banana you eat, you get a lot of potassium from that banana and it's a good part of your diet. Same thing with the first burger you eat and the protein contained in that burger. But if you eat only burgers, your doctor's probably gonna yell at you about your cholesterol. And if you eat only bananas, then potassium that you, absorb, that you get is no longer gonna be able to be absorbed by your body and you're not gonna get much value or nutrition out of that banana. So cost is part of the story, but the value you get from consuming a particular food stuff um, is uh, equally important to considering what you want to eat. And different uh, foods provide, both provide calories, right? So that both a banana and a burger give you calories, um, but they also give you different nutrients and they play different roles in your diet. So they're only partial substitutes. The fact that they both provide calories is useful and that's important, but it's only a piece of the story. And because they're incomplete substitutes, uh, comparing them on cost alone doesn't give you enough information to decide what to eat. And in fact, um, their value declines steadily as you eat more and more of the same type of food or nutrient. And the value of an individual nutrient is often co-determined by all the other things that you're eating and as part of a balanced diet, right? So, you know, if you eat legumes and, and corn, that, that gives you a complete protein and, you know, other examples like that, where the value of an individual um, food is actually based on complementarity with other um, aspects of your diet. So I like this analogy because it's sort of, you know, we can all relate to, to these dietary choices, but that's really exactly how the electricity system works as well, where individual technologies all provide electricity, they all provide kilowatt hours or electrons, but they're incomplete substitutes for one another because they all have different qualities. And in fact, the more and more of any individual type of electricity resource we have in the system, the less valuable they become, as I'll show you in a minute. So what we're looking for is not necessarily the lowest cost technologies, but we're looking for this equilibrium for each technology where their marginal cost is equal to their marginal value in the electricity system. Okay, so this is sort of a general economics concept that you know, we, we have the lowest cost or greatest welfare in the system in an economy when, when everything is sort of equilibrated at marginal cost equal to marginal value um, or marginal revenue that you would earn from a private sector perspective. So this is what we're looking for. And that means comparing the cost of individual technologies to one another is not actually what's gonna tell you how far they're gonna go in the electricity system or in our markets. It's gonna give you um, a, a bias comparison. What you wanna do is compare the cost of an individual technology to its own marginal value at a particular time in a particular electricity system. And in fact, while the cost of solar PV and wind and, and batteries are falling, 
they're actually in a race against their own declining value as we deploy more of these technologies, just like the value of potassium from the bananas starts to decline as you eat more of them. So if we expand the market share of uh, solar PV, which is shown on the x-axis here, several different studies have repeatedly shown that there's a decline in the marginal value of additional uh, solar. So this is the average revenue that would be earned per megawatt hour of electricity generated by solar PV on the, on the y-axis. And we can see it steadily declines almost linearly as we deploy more and more um, solar and it grabs more market share. I've superimposed over on this the um, roughly the current cost of solar PV in the United States, about $36 a megawatt hour. Um, and you can see is that if there were no further cost reductions for solar PV, that there'd be sort of an economic equilibrium or limit to the scale of solar that we want to have in our system, somewhere between maybe 7% and 22% of our electricity supply, depending on the region. And that would be great, but then that would be the end for solar PV, unless we're willing to continue to subsidize it to basically lose money in the electricity markets in perpetuity. The other option is that we can continue to drive down the cost of solar PV, right? If this cost bar continues to outpace the decline in the value, um, which is what's happened so far, then we can keep relying more and more on solar without running into this economic limit. So again, it's the cost of solar versus its own value that's important, not the cost of solar versus wind or, P or nuclear power or um, natural gas uh, fired power plants that will determine how far they go in our system. So why does their value decline? Well, just as a basic explainer of how electricity markets work, like a lot of markets, you basically create a supply curve of all the different uh, electricity resources. They bid into these electricity markets or in centrally run uh, markets, the, the owner of the power plants knows what their marginal cost of production is. So the cost of producing one more megawatt hour of electricity in the short run, ignoring all of their fixed costs from investment. Um, and so this is an example supply curve for the Texas electricity market um, for uh, circuit today, 2020. Um, and you can see it's there are different types of power plants all arranged in order from their uh, lowest cost to highest cost. So nuclear power plants on the bottom, we've got some efficient natural gas combined cycle power plants in blue, uh, a mix of coal fired power plants and a little bit of less efficient gas plants and then uh, combustion turbines and steam turbine gas plants um, up here with lower, um, lower efficiencies and higher marginal costs. So what happens is we stack those up and we find the mix of electricity resources that's needed to meet a given level of electricity demand, say 40 gigawatts of electricity demand at that moment in each hour or 15 minute interval or however often the electricity market clears. And the cost of, or marginal cost of that last generator that's dispatched known as the marginal generator is going to set the electricity market price that everybody is paid. So this person gets enough to just cover their marginal cost of fuel and variable O&M to produce that megawatt hour. But everybody else down here below them gets paid a little bit of extra, um, the white space between their marginal cost and the clearing price. And that uh, gross profit margin is what they use to cover their fixed um, investment costs, paying back investors and covering fixed operation maintenance throughout the year. So this, this inframarginal rent is key to pay off uh, uh, long-term costs. So as electricity demand goes up and down during the day, this produces, or during the seasons, this produces different prices for electricity, right? So when there's higher demand, there's a more expensive plant, which produces a higher price. When there's lower demand, we clear uh, a lower cost resource that produces uh, lower uh, prices. So what happens when we add more renewables to the system is something very similar as what happens when we move demand uh, up and down, which is that we move the supply curve out because renewable resources have zero marginal cost, they show up in the bottom of the supply curve and they push out the demand, the, the supply curve for, of all the other resources. So with a given level of electricity demand, we see the cost um, fall relative to what, it, or the price fall relative to what it was before. So if we had 40 gigawatts of demand before, which produced at this price, now we're uh, producing a much lower price. And that means that the renewable resources that are producing at that time earn less than they would have otherwise in periods when there's less renewable generation. And because they're all correlated in their output, meaning all the wind blows at the same time and all the solar uh, is, is highest in the middle of the day, this drives down the cost or the revenue that, that solar and wind receive much more rapidly than the other technologies, which can choose when they want to generate and generate more power at times like this and less at times like this when prices are lower. So this is what's responsible primarily for driving the decline in the value or revenue that wind and solar earn uh, as they penetrate in the market much more rapidly than other technologies. It's a function of the correlation between their output. They all produce power at the same time. And because they have low marginal costs, they push out the supply curve and down the electricity price 
known as the merit order effect because this curve uh, is known in the electricity literature as the merit order curve or the order of uh, increasing marginal cost. All right, so this is why the value steadily declines. And we see the same thing for energy storage, a little bit different dynamics. This is from a 2016 paper of mine on the value of energy storage. But if you look at storage as a, as a capacity uh, value, so megawatts of capacity installed as a, as a share of peak demand, since electricity is not an energy source, uh, storage is not an energy source, it's a way to move power around in time, um, we, we describe in terms of power capacity. Uh, and so here again, we have the same issue, steadily declining value. Um, and if we can't continue to drive down the, the price of, of storage, uh, it'll max out the role that batteries play in the system. And the reason for that is similar to the other um, examples, but we have some niche markets for uh, what's known as ancillary services, quick variations to, to maintain stability and electricity systems that are much more valuable than energy markets, but are very small. So batteries fill these up pretty quickly. And then the more energy storage we add in order to substitute for generating capacity, we need to add not just megawatts of storage capacity, but increasing megawatt hours or longer duration batteries in order to displace the same amount of megawatts of a natural gas fired power plant, for example. And that's because the first gas plant that you might want to displace might only run for a couple hours, a couple times a year, meaning you only need a two hour battery or two megawatt hours for every megawatt of capacity to displace that gas plant and shut it off. But as you go down the order of gas plants, they start to run more and more frequently. And you have plants that maybe run for 12 or 16 or 24 hours. And then in order to displace 100 megawatts of that gas plant, you might need 1200 megawatts of energy storage. And that adds to the cost of displacing uh, or substituting capacity. The third factor is a decline in the energy arbitrage or buy sell spread that you get when you're a storage operator, right? You buy electricity when the price is low, you hold on to it and you sell it when the price is high. And that spread between the buy price and the sell spread price is your inframarginal rent or your revenue gross margin that you use to pay off all the fixed costs of your battery and, and, and your investors. Um, and like any arbitrage opportunity, the more people that buy when the price is low, the higher the low price gets. And the more people that sell when the price is high, the lower the high price gets, right? And so that compresses the buy sell spread as we um, see more and more energy arbitrage occurring and more and more storage in the system. So their revenues go down. And then the last factor is potentially a decline in the utilization rate where, um, you know, the first storage resource you deploy, you might cycle, uh, cycle it, meaning charge and discharge uh, two or three times a day. But as we deploy more and more storage, Maybe it'll only uh, you know, cycle three times a week and then maybe only once a week and then maybe only, only a couple times a year. Uh, and so that declining utilization rate means that the, uh, the implicit cost, uh, amortized cost of your fixed costs over multiple cycles starts to, to go up as well. So um, these dynamics are described a bit more in another recent paper, um, the 2020 paper on, on battery energy storage, uh, which can be accessed at this link in Applied Energy. So what this means is that just like in our diet, uh, wind and solar and batteries are low cost and we're gonna use a lot of them over the next decade, but they're only a piece of a balanced electricity diet. And in a 2018 paper, which I'll describe in a minute, my colleagues and I described basically three key pieces of our overall balanced electricity diet. The first is where wind and solar play a big role. That's our fuel saving variable renewable resources. So when we have wind and solar or run of river hydro plants or some, things like that with no fuel cost, it allows us to use that electricity and displace a technology like say natural gas or coal that does consume fuel and has a much higher variable cost. And so the savings or the value of a megawatt hour of electricity from solar is effectively the cost of the megawatt hour of some fuel consuming resource that's displaced by that solar and wind. That's where most of the value of solar and wind come from, at least at high penetration levels. And so the role they play primarily is in reducing the amount of fuel consumption and saving the cost. So we call them fuel saving variable renewables. The second category is where batteries fit in, but also scheduling or flexible demand. So moving around when we consume electricity, like when we charge our electric vehicles and demand response or curtailing our consumption when electricity prices are really high and supply is, is you know, more short. Um, and these are good at, at fast bursts of output to balance supply and demand over short time intervals. But because batteries are energy constrained as, and we don't want to delay our consumption for too long, um, these are basically shorter duration energy constrained options. So they're good for fast bursts of output, but not sustained output over long periods of time. What that leaves is the final category, which is where we really need more work and innovation um, to expand and improve our toolkit. And that's 
uh, what I call firm low carbon resources, which I'll just define in a minute, but includes technologies like geothermal, nuclear, coal or gas with CCS, biomass combustion or gasification, and any kind of zero carbon gas uh, combustion. This could be hydrogen, ammonia, um, uh, or synthetic methane uh, or biomethane produced from carbon neutral sources. So firm low carbon resources, we describe firm resources as any electricity resource that's dispatchable, meaning we can call on it on demand any time of the year and run it as long as we might need it by system operators to maintain uh, the supply and demand balance and reliability of our electricity systems. So I put an image of a combustion turbine on here because the bulk of our firm capacity in the US today comes from, uh, from gas fired power plants, mostly combustion turbines and combined cycle power plants that combine a combustion turbine and a steam turbine. We also, of course, get firm generation from uh, nuclear and coal, primarily using um, Rankine cycles. Uh, but the sort of the most flexible and largest component of our firm fleet today are combustion turbines. What we need in the long term is in a way to basically replace the functional role that these uh, resources play in our electricity system now while producing CO2 emissions with a clean firm substitute of some sort or another. So a technology that can provide uh, electricity on demand any time of the year for as long as we need it um, to fill in periods when wind and solar output is low and, um, and we've already run out of our uh, energy stored in our batteries uh, and to sustain that output over those long, longer periods of time that occur. Um, and to do so without contributing to CO2 emissions as part of a clean electricity system. So in a 2018 paper in Juul, my colleagues and I worked uh, to explore this role of firm low carbon resources and to figure out when we really need to transition from natural gas to these uh, cleaner firm options and how far we can go with wind, solar and batteries in the near term. What we did was look at a couple of different systems. I'm showing results here for our Northern Latitude system. Um, so uh, with electricity demand patterns similar to the Northeastern United States. Um, and what we did was we, we did a whole different range of uh, combinations of cost assumptions for wind and solar and batteries as one group, um, nuclear and carbon capture and sequestration with another as another uh, combination. So gas plants that capture their CO2 emissions and new nuclear power plants. And then bioenergy availability and cost. So bi solid biomass and, and biomethane as a zero carbon fuel. Um, and then we ran an increasingly tight CO2 emissions limits to start ratcheting down the role of natural gas in the system. Um, we have about 500 uh, grams of uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour in the grid today. So um, this is about 100 grams is about an 80% reduction. This is about 90% and then we get into 95, 99, 98, 100% uh, clean electricity as we get closer to zero here. So what this is showing is the, the basic setup of the design was sort of a with and without uh, analysis where we ran a case that just had wind, solar, batteries and demand flexibility. So fuel saving and fast burst options. Um, but the only firm option we had was natural gas. So we were missing this wedge of clean firm technologies. And then we had another case where for every combination of wind, solar and batteries we had uh, in terms of cost, which are shown in the colors here, we ran several different combinations of cost assumptions for the firm uh, options, the biomass and biogas and the nuclear and CCS. So that's why there's multiple dots here uh, for every um, single case of um, solar and wind and battery cost assumptions. And what we can see is that at a, about 100 grams per kilowatt hour or an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions, there really isn't much of a difference between the scenarios that have access to these advanced clean firm technologies and those that don't. So what that means is we can drive wind and solar uh, and batteries into our system over the next, say, decade, reduce CO2 emissions rapidly, and rely on natural gas power plants to play a firm role with less utilization of those plants, but uh, keeping their capacity around uh, to provide flexibility and reliability. Um, after that point, though, these costs start to diverge, right? And so we start to see, especially as we get closer to zero emissions, and we can't rely on our natural gas plants for extended periods of time, that the costs rise really rapidly for uh, scenarios that don't have some kind of clean firm substitute. Whereas for any given cost assumption we have for the how, you know, be as ambitious you want as to the cost of wind, solar, and batteries, it's anywhere from 10 to 65% more, uh, a lower cost if we have the clean firm resources available. Even the least ambitious assumptions about clean firm technologies um, and the most ambitious assumptions about, um, about the cost declines for wind, solar, and batteries produce a cost savings if we have one of those firm low carbon resources in a zero carbon grid. 
So this shows that firm resources are a critical component of a carbon-free electricity supply. Um, and while we can rely on natural gas plants in the near term, we need um, some kind of substitute for those technologies in the longer term. And that means we have some time to continue to develop and improve these technologies, but only if we act proactively in the near term. So to wrap up this section, the sort of a tutorial on, on the energy macro scale energy system modeling that we do, we can see a few different reasons why if you want to try to evaluate a novel technology, say a technology that's not going to be in the market for another five, 10 or 15 years, we need to use the kind of macro scale energy system models that I use in our, our research to understand the role those technologies will play, how they'll interact with all the other technologies and where we can uh, get the most bang for our buck in terms of innovation and research effort. Um, to improve these technologies and make them more valuable contributors to the grid. And that's because cost is not the same as value. And that means that simple comparisons based on cost are going to be elusive. We can't just say, well, this technology is cheaper than another, um, or lowering the cost is better at all cost. In fact, in some cases, it might be better to have a higher cost technology that delivers greater value by having more flexibility or, or other means. Um, and so uh, we need to find instead the equilibrium for each technology between its marginal cost and its marginal value. That's what we're looking for. And so we need a long-term equilibrium model that can capture those dynamics over time. And that's because marginal cost and marginal value for individual technologies will change with increasing penetration of each technology. So it's a dynamic uh, uh, system over time. And we need to be able to find how that will evolve and where the equilibrium points lie as those um, marginal costs and marginal values change. Uh, in addition, te different technologies are incomplete substitutes for one another, just like the banana is an incomplete substitute for the burger. Um, and there are some complementarities in these systems, right? So sometimes having more of one technology adds to the value of another technology rather than takes away from it. Um, and that means there are complex interactions between these different technologies. And those interactions all occur at a large systems level, um, which means that their value is co-determined. Uh, by their interactions at a system level. In some ways, their value is an emergent property of this complex energy system. So what we need are large scale models that can capture those um, complex interactions that are dynamic or evolve over time and can reveal the equilibrium value um, and cost for different technologies in combinations in different contexts. Um, and that's exactly the kind of modeling that we do uh, in our group. So with those sorts of tools, we really can comprehensively evaluate certain advanced low carbon technologies. So I'm going to use a case study here um, of long duration energy storage. So I, I showed how the value of wind and solar uh, falls, how they drive down the electricity price when they're generating. Um, one of the ways we can get around that potentially would be to use long duration energy storage technologies that can store power for more than just a few hours like batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries can and absorb all that cheap electricity when it's available for wind and solar, hold on to it for several days or weeks or even months, and then generate it when we need it for long periods of time. And in that way, long duration storage is thought to maybe be a substitute uh, for the firm generation options or another firm resource uh, available uh, to add to our portfolio. Now, and there's been an increasing amount of focus on these technologies with investments from RPE, from private sector investors like Breakthrough Energy Ventures and, and a variety of, um, of demonstrations going on um, from uh, in Europe and the United States and elsewhere of these sort of long duration options. So a couple of years ago, my colleagues at MIT and I started to evaluate these technologies. And fortunately, just uh, this week, um, we finally got our paper on this accepted in Nature Energy. So this will be coming out probably in January or February issues of Nature Energy. But we did a very comprehensive evaluation in this paper of the full design space or range of options and cost and performance that lo various long duration energy storage technologies of different types might be able to deliver and to try to understand their role in uh, carbon free electricity resources. So there are a lot of different ways we could try to provide long term energy storage. There are mechanical energy storage options like compressing air underground um, or in tanks. Pumped hydro is the biggest sort of storage option we have now where we pump um, hydropower up, up hill and then use it uh, later when we need it. There are a bunch of different chemical options, mostly around uh, using electricity and electrolysis to produce hydrogen or to then create synthetic gas um, via methanation processes and then store that and convert it back to power, either in a Brayton cycle or combined cycle power plant or using a fuel cell. So all of these chemical options involve um, some kind of combustion or oxidization of the fuel back into electricity. And then we have a set of electrochemical options like flow batteries of different types, um, metal air batteries potentially, 
and then thermal options that take electricity to produce heat, store that heat, and then convert it back to electricity somehow. And there's a few different uh, paths there. There's multi-junction PV cells that um, basically heat up a big block of something that gets really, really hot, and then use that heat um, as a thermal um, radiation source for, um, for photovoltaic power uh, panels that are tuned to the thermal spectrum. Uh, there's reciprocating heat pumps that um, are very efficient at charging because they use heat pumps and then they reverse that process to discharge. And then there's uh, these fire brick options, which are basically large ceramic bricks that you heat up with resistive heating. Um, and then uh, to very high temperatures, high enough to, to, do, to use um, that hot expansion of the, the hot air to run a Brayton cycle or combined cycle power plant. So these are all various options. And if we evaluate them on different energy, a different cost and performance parameters, like their charging cost, so the cost for a capacity to charge the system, the discharge uh, cost, so the cost for capacity to discharge the system, and sometimes those are the same thing, like for pumped hydro or compressed air, it's the same device. But for many of these, those are two different devices. So think about um, hydrogen electrolysis being your charge component for a power to gas to power cycle. And then the um, power plant or fuel cell is your discharge cost, right? And so those are two different costs. They can be sized independently. Um, and, uh, and that's true for several different technologies. And then we have independently of that usually, the energy capacity cost or the cost of storing one more kilowatt hour of electricity. And then we have charge efficiencies and discharge efficiencies, which again can be asymmetric for technologies that use two different processes. So we have five different characteristics here. Um, we can combine charge and discharge into weighted power cost and to round trip efficiency to sort of condense this five dimensional space into three dimensions for visualization. But in the study, we actually looked at all five of these dimensions independently because some of these technologies are, are variable. So if we sort of map this out across the space, this is what we call the design space. So this is the range of options of different combinations between these five parameters here visualized in three dimensions with round trip efficiency on the y-axis, uh, weighted power cost, which is the combination of charge and discharge powers, um, depending on the ratio of those two technologies in your system. Um, uh, on the, the x-axis, and then the different panels are the cost of kilowatt hours of energy storage or the energy storage capacity cost. Um, and you can see is that while not every you know, area in this design space is feasible with current and, and, and future improvement of current technologies, we map across most of this range with available options in mechanical, thermal, chemical, and electrochemical technologies. Um, so we actually expanded to go beyond this range. We sort of took this um, frontier of the available technologies here in these black lines as what we call the future feasible region for um, these technologies. And there's two different lines. There's one for technologies that are unconstrained in their location. And there's another set for those like underground um, compressed air or hydrogen storage or pumped hydro, which are geographically specific, right? You have to have the right geology to deploy these technologies. And so um, that dotted line, it, they're typically cheaper, um, are technologies that require specific geologies. So we actually explored this full range of options. Um, and basically the motivation was can, you know, given all these various options, a whole different set of places we could devote our efforts in terms of society and innovation and investment. Um, can we use electricity system models to, you know, cheaply screen this huge range of options and to try to better target future investment and innovation efforts? To do this, we use the electricity system model that I built uh, with Nestor Sepulveda at MIT during my dissertation. And we continue to build out and, and work on collaboratively with my lab at Princeton and the MIT Energy Initiative. And we're preparing to release this tool as an open source model in the first quarter of next year. Um, it's called the Gen X Electricity System Expansion Model. And it's built in Julia and Jump, which are open source uh, programming languages. We um, looked at the, the full range of these five different uh, design and cost parameters. So charge cost, discharge cost for capacity, uh, energy cost for capacity, and then charge and discharge efficiencies. And for each of those five parameters, we took four different discrete values that spanned the range that we um, defined in this, you know, this uh, graphic here, uh, based on our literature review. And then we took all of the discrete combinations of all of those different points. So we have four different uh, levels and five different uh, parameters. We end up with a, a four to the fifth different discrete common combinations or 1,024 uh, discrete combinations of different cost and performance um, parameters that might be realized by current or future long duration energy storage technologies. We, uh, to test whether these could be effective substitutes for firm generation options, 
Um, we tested them against three different uh, technologies, each individually modeled. So whereas in the, uh, the previous study, we had them all as options, we wanted to explore the interaction with different types of uh, firm generation options. Those that have uh, very high fixed costs like nuclear and low variable costs, ranging all the way to technologies that have low fixed costs like um, using uh, zero carbon hydrogen from natural gas or, or electrolysis um, in a combustion turbine or combined cycle power plant. So these have low fixed costs and high variable costs, relatively speaking. And then we have gas plants with CCS um, in the middle. So this is sort of a intermediate cost um, in terms of both fixed and variable costs. So this gives us a nice a range of different technologies. To explore the impact of variability in weather patterns, including wind and solar and demand, we looked at a northern system that with weather patterns from the northeast and a southern system uh, with weather patterns from Texas. And for the northern system, we looked at current demand patterns and also what happens if we electrify a whole bunch of transportation and heating, which will modify the demand pattern significantly. All in all, with all the different variabilities we did, we end up with uh, 17,920 different cases, almost 18,000 cases that we're running. So a lot of use of parallel computing capability to run thousands of cases, um, which you know, takes a lot of processor time, but otherwise is a really cheap way to explore a huge range of possible futures and try to understand under which of those conditions long duration energy storage is really a valuable um, component of our system or an effective substitute for the firm, uh, clean firm generation options. So what did we find? Well, the first thing we found is that of the five different design parameters that we looked at, energy capacity cost is the most important determinant of the value of long duration energy storage. So the cost of storing one kilowatt hour of electricity in whatever storage medium you have is the most important design parameter. Here we're showing the val system value of uh, having energy storage, uh, long duration storage versus not having it, uh, measured as the percentage reduction in system cost for a given case uh, where we don't have storage versus the case where we have energy storage with a particular combination of cost and performance. We now have three different panels here because this is uh, the top is com competition against nuclear and the middle is uh, gas with carbon capture and sequestration and the bottom is hydrogen combustion using some kind of expensive carbon free um, hydrogen option. So uh, energy capacity cost is the most important determinant. We are you know, varying this from one to 50 here, as opposed to power costs going from 200 to 1800. So much greater variation on this axis than the panels. And yet we see substantial reductions in costs. We verify this using a multiple regression analysis that shows that energy capacity is the most important factor. The second most important factor is discharge efficiency, which is more important than the charging efficiency of the system. That makes a little bit of intuitive sense once you see the result and unpack it, which is that uh, discharge efficiency or the amount of energy you lose when you discharge your system is determines how much uh, both energy storage capacity you have to have and charging capacity you have to have in order to get one kilowatt hour of electricity out of your system at the end, right? Because if you can double the efficiency of your discharging, you only need half as much energy storage capacity to store your energy and half as much charging capacity to, to, to charge that storage um, to get a kilowatt hour out on the back end. Otherwise you lose, you know, if you lose twice as much, you need to store twice as much. Um, and so since energy capacity cost is the most important factor and discharge efficiency kind of directly substitutes for energy capacity cost, uh, it is an equally important parameter. And discharge efficiency for technologies that are asymmetric will give you much more bang for the buck than improving charge efficiency by the same percentage uh, improvement. The second thing we can look at is that when we really wanna talk about significant cost savings, which we define here as a greater than 10% reduction in the cost of electricity, um, it narrows the range of options quite considerably. So we really need technologies that have less than $20 per kilowatt hour of cost, and ideally much less than that. Um, and we need a certain combination of uh, sufficient um, power and uh, power cost and efficiency to get those significant cost savings here. So just roughly speaking, I've shaded out the areas of the design space and competition against different technologies that don't deliver very much cost savings. So what we can see is there's still a pretty wide range of the design space. Uh, this again is the sort of feasible region of different uh, combinations of technologies uh, in the, the red lines here. Uh, solid again being technologies that are not geographically constrained and the dot line, dotted line being those that need a particular geology. Um, and uh, we can see there's still a lot of that design space that falls in the unshaded area here. So as a key takeaway, what we find is that long duration energy storage, if we have it at these cost and performance levels, 
could significantly reduce the cost of a zero carbon electricity system relative to not having that technology at all. So it's an, an additional valuable contrib contributor to our 100% carbon free portfolio. However, if we want to see whether uh, long duration storage can fully displace the need for firm generation options, as we saw in our previous uh, 2018 paper, it's a much narrower range of options that meet that need. So um, this chart now shows the displacement or reduction in capacity of firm generation options when we add the long duration storage to the system. And I want to just call your attention to the, the red uh, portions here, which are you know, basically 100% or nearly 100% displacement or substitution of firm generation capacity. So these are the cases where we don't need any kind of combustion or a nuclear power plant, where we can just have wind and solar and batteries and long duration energy storage and meet our reliability needs all throughout the year for, for, um, for clean electricity. So this it, it shows that when you're competing against a nuclear or technology with a high fixed cost and a low variable cost, which I call a flexible base technology, there is some area of the design space that um, can do that, but it's a pretty narrow area uh, here up in the upper left corner of these three panels. With costs for energy storage capacity less than $10 a kilowatt hour and store, uh, round trip efficiencies generally above 40% uh, with a particularly low uh, power cost. Um, there's a few technologies that could meet this. Compressed air and hydrogen storage fall in this part of the feasible region when you have the suitable geology for very large underground caverns like salt caverns or saline aquifers. And then you have a couple of electrochemical options like very low cost metal air technologies or aqueous sulfur, which a few companies are working on now that might be able to fall into the edge of that range. However, if you look at competition with the technologies that have lower fixed cost and a more fuel cost, it's a much more narrow region, really the far upper corner of these two areas which falls outside of the future feasible region that we found in the literature review. So any projections for future costs for these technologies. And that basically means that, um, and, and then if we look at high electrification of demand in a Northern latitude climate, which pushes the demand variability to be a greater degree and pushes it more towards winter seasons, even for nuclear, we fall out, the 100% substitution gets more difficult. Basically the substitution moves up into the left as you move between today's demand and electrified demand. Um, and that means that even for nuclear, it's difficult to substitute. So whereas long duration energy storage is a valuable uh, co component of a low carbon grid, it looks like um, under future, under likely ranges of cost and performance, that long duration energy storage is not likely to be a full replacement for clean firm generating resources, right? So it's a, another additional complement, but not a full substitute. And additionally, um, only at very low cost per kilowatt hour, like a dollar per kilowatt hour, does long duration storage exhibit seasonal behavior as opposed to uh, cycling patterns that last over several days. So this chart shows the uh, duration of energy storage discharge that's could, that can be sustained by a given technology. So uh, that accounts for its energy capacity and discharge efficiency and its discharge capacity. And in here we have, you know, less than uh, 10 hours in this range. So this is, you know, intradaily storage over a few hours. Um, and then uh, here we have a few days worth of storage. So maybe up to a week. Uh, and then in this green range here, which only falls in the dollar per kilowatt hour area, we have, um, you know, several hundred hours, which could be weeks worth of sustained discharge. And we can see this when we look at the actual state of charge patterns for a couple of different cases. Um, here, a case where we've not just displaced uh, firm generation, but also lithium ion batteries. And here, a case where lithium ion batteries and long duration storage coexist. And then you can see that only in the dollar per kilowatt hour bar up here, uh, column and, or row on the top, do we see this sort of seasonal pattern of charge and discharge with little uh, shorter term cycles riding on top of that. In the other cases, we see more weekly, week long patterns um, of discharge and charge uh, over shorter durations as the cost per kilowatt hour goes up. So uh, to conclude, this type of screening effort can really uh, examine a huge range of different combinations of cost and performance that might be feasible for different long duration energy storage technologies. And the same can be true for other uh, future energy technologies with a wide range of design options. And it can help us narrow in the range of choices to a much more narrow range of the design space. We basically have lopped off more than half of the overall design space as not capable of delivering more than a 10% reduction in electricity system costs. So anything in that space is, you know, kind of on the margin, you know, it'd be nice to have, but might make some people some money, but it's not gonna really dramatically change 
the overall electricity system picture. Whereas this portion of the design space is capable, it appears, of delivering significant cost savings. And there's a variety of technologies that fit into that space. So if we go back to our literature review and we say, all right, which of these squares that we put on here uh, relates to which technology, we can sort of map back individual technologies onto the range of uh, the design space that looks particularly valuable. And we have you know, very low cost pumped hydro storage, potentially heat pump storage technologies in this space. The most attractive ones fall over here with very low cost per kilowatt hour. Um, and that's primarily hydrogen and underground caverns, very large compressed air storage. And then a few thermal and electrochemical options um, like uh, the fire brick ceramic storage with combined cycle and, and combustion turbine power plants in these two um, blocks. And then metal air and aqueous sulfur electrochemical options. And then maybe hydrogen storage, although it's in the sort of worst area of this design space, um, if we store them in above ground tanks. Um, so really we want to sort of be in the, the upper left component of each of these boxes. And that gives us a much more narrow range to focus on. And if we have limited effort and we can only improve one or two performance parameters, we now know that the most important parameters to focus on are cost per kilowatt hour and discharge efficiency with other parameters like charge cost um, and uh, discharge cost and charge efficiency being uh, much less determinative of the value of these technologies. So we did this for energy storage. Um, we're applying similar techniques now to look at the design and optimization of natural gas power plants with carbon capture and sequestration that are designed for flexible operation alongside intermittent or variable wind and solar technologies. And so this is an RPE funded project from their flexible uh, CCS program or FLEX, where we're actually playing a role in our lab as a, as a um, uh, evaluator of a range of different design tech, uh, tech, uh, methods that our design options that uh, 12 different uh, RPE funded teams are working on for different approaches to flexible operation of CCS. We're gonna use our energy system tools to evaluate all 12 of those designs as well as probably a much broader sensitivity analysis and then provide that feedback to RPE for decision-making and their next round of funding as to which technologies they wanna focus on. So this is a great partnership with RPE and their flex program in order to not just you know, use our tools to publish a paper, but also to help drive investment decisions and funding decisions at RPE. So we're really excited to be working on this right now. We're working with Fervo Energy, which is an enhanced geothermal energy startup company and a, a SBIR funded project from the Geothermal Technology Office to also evaluate uh, flexible operation of advanced geothermal energy systems that might be able to use pressure buildup in the reservoir that they create um, through, uh, um, through hydraulic fracturing to create enhanced geothermal systems to build up pressure in that reservoir when electricity prices are low and then to generate more electricity when prices are high. And that sort of turns these otherwise sort of always on about baseload power plants into um, a very flexible low carbon firm uh, generating option. And we found that that flexibility delivers almost twice as much value in some cases as um, in uh, without flexibility. So we're working with the, with these the, this company right now to help evaluate their technology and to um, guide geothermal technology office funding. And the last project is uh, in partnership with PPPL and um, Iguan and, and I's colleague in, um, in mechanical and aerospace engineering at Princeton, Egeman Coleman, um, looking at uh, techno-economic techno evaluation and optimization of future commercial fusion energy technology. So as fusion moves from lab uh, science into engineering practicalities, um, we're trying to look ahead 20 or 30 years to the future electricity and energy systems that fusion uh, technologies might contribute to and try to understand how you would want to design and engineer those technologies to be the most valuable contributors to future low carbon grids. So that's, um, that's it. I know I've sort of used most of the hour for the presentation, but would be happy to stick around a little longer to answer any questions that you have. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share our work with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, and uh, for Thank the uh, for talk. And uh, I think with Professor Wen-Tin Song from Georgia Tech will chair that the uh, QA session. Wen-Tin, please. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, again. Um, so your uh, work uh, is the micro scale level. Uh, um, and our work, for example, probably is a micro scale level because we may focus mm -hmm. on a single reaction or species, how it affects the combustion system. So yep. it's uh, always nice to have a, a seminar from different backgrounds. Uh, so uh, we enjoyed your talk very much. So in the following, we will go to the Q&A session. So I will share my screen. I already collected uh, some uh, 
uh, let's see here, uh, some of the questions over here. Uh, so I will ask uh, the uh, panelists, uh, if the question is from the panelists, I will ask them to turn the camera on and ask you directly. And if they couldn't, so I will ask on their behalf. So the first uh, question is from Professor Katharina Coase. I understand that you also advise locally and also nationally about actual decisions that need to be taken. Now, I, I'm in a work group of our National um, Academy of Engineering um, towards a European grid, mm -hmm. electricity, sector coupling, and so on. And um, the, well, the key factors are the data that you have to have about yeah. the system and its operability today and how to make the transition to actually, well, use the wise decision locally at a given point. Now, yeah. the data flux about the you know, various streams of energies and, and um, let's say matter, um, we find in Europe is quite incomplete. And if you need real-time data, you have electricity prices and import and export, but you don't have you know, your given location in Belgium at a given point in time and can optimize that on the system. So that's the background of my question. Yeah. What kind of data do you have? How much real time do you need? What is your wish list about data? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with, you know, the more, the more spatial scope and sectoral scope of your models and the more temporal and geographic resolution you need, uh, the more data you, you know, more data hungry these models become over time. And, uh, because we're increasingly reliant, not just on variable renewables in the electricity sector, but electricity to provide and substitute for all the other you know, needs like heating and, and you know, mm -hmm. fuels production and others. Mm -hmm. It's no longer enough to just study the electricity sector at a large scale and ignore the temporal details. And it's no longer really enough to just look at electricity alone, right? You, you mentioned sector coupling. That's yeah. the sort of European uh, buzzword, but it's increasingly the, the focus of the macro scale energy systems community because we have to look at how these systems interact with each other. So mm -hmm. data is really challenging. I've actually, um, uh, the first grant that I received uh, after becoming a professor was to, uh, from the Spitzer Trust in the US to build an open source uh, data platform for electricity system modeling in the United States context mm -hmm. that could pull together all the various data sources we could find and supplement them with additional research. Um, and to uh, create a set of scripts that allow a user to pull all those together at a different spatial scope or scale and parameterize the kind of electricity system models that we do. We're still electricity only, um, mm -hmm. although we do um, have estimates of how electricity demand will change mm -hmm. uh, via heat from heat pumps and electric vehicle charging. So we start to kind of capture the edges. Mm -hmm. um, but that's been a huge, I mean, that's been a year and a half long effort just to build that platform in the US. Um, mm -hmm. And there's still much more work to be done. I'm also part of a, a effort called the Open Energy Modeling or Open Energy uh, Outlook here in the US, which is um, led by uh, Joseph de Carolis at, uh, at North Carolina State University and um, Paulina Jaramillo at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is a big distributed team of about 30 different researchers with different expertise mm -hmm. trying to do the equivalent of what the U.S. Energy Information Administration does with their annual energy outlook, which covers all sectors of the U.S., um, but in a fully open data, open modeling environment. And so we're gathering, compiling a whole bunch of data for that process, too. And it's, okay. a, it's just a ton of work before you can even do the, do the research. So, yeah, you've... I, I see, and I uh, renounce for the second part of my question, because there's a lot of questions and I don't want to monopolize. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So now let's move to Professor G. Gore. So uh, I kind of typed up uh, very quickly quite a few questions, but uh, I want to ask two. Uh, uh, Professor Jenkins, uh, uh, with uh, three or four times in the, this century, the energy crisis and climate crisis hitting us and being uh, recognized by various communities, uh, there's been a lot of effort and the literature as well as uh, uh, papers and uh, initiatives and groups and networks uh, uh, tend to be very duplicative. Mm. Uh, so I'd like your thought on uh, how we could avoid uh, duplicative work. For example, within the last 10 days, I have attended five uh, seminars 
that uh, have about 70 to 80 percent overlap uh, uh, in terms of what they presented. So that's one question. Mm. The second question I have is how we can, the, there is a very, very large uh, percentage of current energy generation around the world, not just US, but all around the world, particularly in China and India, that is coal-based. And I very specifically noticed that you talked about, whenever you talked about fossil, you're talking about natural gas. Whenever you're talking about combustion, you're talking about either hydrogen or natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, have you truly given up on coal? And if that is the case, then how do you suggest uh, we transition very large number of uh, workforce in North Dakota, South Dakota, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, yeah. and uh, many other uh, states in the US as well as world communities? Uh, that's the second question. And third is, uh, I did not hear the word exergy or exergetic efficiency in your uh, speech or presentation, uh, but I heard many sentences that suggested that exergy would be a very important uh, property. Uh, well, it's not a property, but exergy would be a consideration that would lead to uh, improved solutions uh, for uh, local as well as global challenges. So I'll, I'll sort of keep those three questions with you and then I'll listen. Great. Um, so in terms of duplication of effort, I'm not really sure I have a good answer to that question. I mean, I think it is a, a challenge. I mean, one way that we can, I think in the research community make progress on that is by, um, you know, is by building more coherent research communities and collaborative projects. So both the macro energy systems community that we're trying to build is I think in some ways an effort to Help, uh, help us all understand what we're all doing and different researchers are doing, find collaborative opportunities and also to you know, point the way to the frontiers in the field where we really need to focus our effort. Um, and then the open energy uh, outlook effort that I was talking about is really an effort to sort of coordinate a big distributed team to work together on a national energy outlook rather than all trying to do duplicative or smaller scale efforts. Um, so that's one way we can help in terms of government coordination, which I think is another thing your typed up question was hinting at. Uh, you know, we really need a lot more of that. I hope I'm hopeful that the new administration is going to implement a little bit better coordination. Um, but you know, we we have a Department of Energy that isn't really our energy innovation agency, right? It's it, it's mostly our nuclear weapons uh, uh, and you know nuclear production cleanup uh, agency. If you look at its total budget, I mean, only a fraction of what DOE does is related to um, you know energy. Uh, technology. And then, you know, we have a whole bunch of other decisions about energy that are spread across departments of interior, defense, um, uh, EPA, etc. And so um, it is a challenge in the federal government. It's much more distributed than, say, Department of Transportation having, you know, primary jurisdiction over all transportation related questions. Um, as far as uh, the employment challenges, or I should say in terms of coal and its role, I, you know, I did mostly focus on natural gas and hydrogen because I am mostly focused on US context in this talk. Um, and here, of course, we have very low cost natural gas in North America. That's not true in all regions globally, although certain places like Australia or the Middle East also have uh, ample supplies of low cost gas and we'll probably see similar options. Um, and our coal-fired power plant here in the United States is very old, on average 40 years old for each power plant in the US. And they're already declining in output um, and, and retiring at a rapid clip. And so we really just continue that trend through the next decade to retire the rest of the aging fleet and replace it with newer assets. In places like China or India, where the coal-fired power fleet is much uh, younger and where natural gas supplies are less in abundant, uh, figuring out how to transition coal to lower cost uh, or lower emissions is, is a critical piece. And that's where carbon capture and sequestration uh, may play a role, although the geology in India and China are also not well suited necessarily to um, CO2 sequestration. So much more work needs to be done in those contexts to understand what geologic sequestration opportunities there are. Um, and if we can't continue to rely on coal in those contexts, then we need low cost, low carbon substitutes um, that can work in, a, in an emerging economy context where you're not going to pay as much as Germany is willing to pay for, you know, for clean electricity. So I think that's the key challenge. Um, in terms of efficiency, I just wanted to quickly say it, if you're talking about a carbon bearing source or a, a source of electricity that would otherwise emit CO2, then efficiency is critical to improve. If you're talking about technologies that produce low cost electricity from, you know, wind or solar, it may not be the most important factor, right? We could actually 
use a lot more low carbon electricity um, because it's cheaper and it doesn't emit CO2. And so, you know, BTU for BTU or, or uh, exajoule for exajoule, um, the efficiency that we really need to focus on is in our use of carbon bearing fuels, hydrocarbons, and less so in electricity, although the more efficient we are, of course, the less infrastructure we have to build. But um, you have to pay attention both to the efficiency and basically the cost and carbon content of the fuel uh, to think about how we want to optimize our system. So that's, you know, the, I would say the exergetic efficiency is an important piece of the, the puzzle, but not, not the full story if, we, if we're thinking about the different carbon content and cost of different, different energy sources. I hope that helps. Oh, and uh, the job transition issue, uh, I would say stay tuned for our Net Zero America study next Tuesday. We look extensively at this for the United States and calculate the impacts of job uh, on employment in incumbent and new sectors across every state of the country. And coal uh, is locally important in West Virginia and Kentucky and a few other places, um, but actually employs very little people, particularly in the Western fields, because it's all surface mining. Um, and even in the in West Virginia, coal, coal employment is quite small relative to oil and gas. Um, and so really the oil and gas transitions where most of the jobs are, but at a local level um, in certain counties, coal is, is extremely important. So these uh, employment transitions, we study very closely in the Net Zero America study, and, and that'll be out next Tuesday if you want to dive in more on that. Have you visited North Dakota or South Dakota anytime? I've not personally been there, no. Or Wyoming? The very, very yeah. important states of the United States of America. Sure, of course. Yeah, no, I mean, so we will look at state level analysis of all of these states. And in fact, um, on a net, uh, there is net job creation in all states of the country, except for two or three over particular decades. Um, West Virginia in the first decade of the transition uh, because of coal, fired, uh, coal mining job declines. Um, but then it actually sees net job growth after that um, due to growth of wind and solar and other technologies. Um, and Louisiana, which uh, sees a decline in employment in the 2040s, so not for another two decades. North Dakota actually, and South Dakota in particular, see net job increases as wind and solar expansion, particularly wind power in those two states, um, offsets job losses in, um, in oil and gas fields and, and coal mining. Um, so there's a you know, big transition opportunity and on net, we see um, between a half a million and a million new jobs in energy related sectors um, uh, created over the next decade. So even as coal fired uh, or coal related jobs uh, decline, the growth in newer industries um, more than offsets that. Um, now, of course, if it's your particular job you're talking about, you don't really care if there's a net job creation, right? So the, the, trans the dislocation and transition is critical to look at. But in terms of overall employment, it's really a, a positive story for the country, particularly if we increase the domestic manufacturing uh, content share for solar PV and wind, which could be further produced in the United States. Now, if you look at newspapers like Bismarck Times from North Dakota, you would see bank uh, discussion of very large bankruptcies and uh, hundreds of jobs being lost. Uh, but yeah, yeah. but bankruptcies of uh, plants that uh, still have uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars capital uh, left in them. Yep. Uh, and so my suggestion would be that when you think of studies of the kind that you described, great study, uh, I think transitioning from coal uh, needs to be a component of those uh, yeah, that transitioning in a manner that uh, does not leave capital behind and does not leave uh, people behind from uh, yep. these that's states. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly what, uh, so again, check out the Net Zero America study. It's exactly what we're focused on. Um, even at a plant by plant level, we look at which retiring coal fired power plants are most likely to be able to be repowered as a new, either natural gas plant with carbon capture or a nuclear power plant uh, in a low carbon context so that we can keep employment locally in those areas as well. Um, and then of course, looking as well at, you know, what the job growth opportunities are in certain states and how we can um, you know, reapportion the manufacturing bases in ways that would help um, offset losses in certain states as well. So that's an, a critical focus of our study, um, yeah. and and exactly okay. where the politics you know will will be determined. I'm sure. Yeah. So let's move to the next question. So this is from my audience. How do you see the reduced fossil fuels uh, affecting grid stability? So he is interested mm -hmm. in monthly or seasonal variations in terms of the grid stability. Yeah. So it, it, the more variable renewable resources we have, the more um, 
the, we really see variability across all time scales from you know, minutes to hours to days to seasons. Um, and that's why we need a mix of what I call these fast burst technologies, which are you know, demand flexibility, battery storage, et cetera, which are good at short-term, smoothing out these short-term variations over you know, minutes and hours. Um, as well as firm generation options that can uh, meet longer term and seasonal variability. So we have these periods that the Germans uh, call Dunkelflaute um, or periods of dark doldrums when there's very little sunshine and very little wind. Um, and those can persist for days or even weeks or months um, where you have lower net output from wind and solar than the demand in a particular region. And those are the time periods when firm generation technologies are critical to meet those long term variability. And if we have long duration energy storage, it sort of fits in between. So the long duration storage technologies I was talking about might um, you know, go longer than the fast burst technologies, but not as long as the firm generation options. And so they sort of slot in between in the categories um, and expand our range of options for different uh, ranges or different time periods of variation in wind and solar. And so really we need a whole combination of those options to uh, continue to uh, provide reliability at low cost uh, without the conventional firm um, fossil power plants that we typically rely on today for that role. Uh, thank you very much. I think because of time limitation, so I will go ahead and read the rest of the questions. Okay. And the following question is from Professor Tiafang Gang. And how do you think about carbon capture and storage in power plant systems yeah. for carbon neutral electricity production? Yeah, so I think carbon capture and storage could be a very important um, uh, option, uh, both in the US and globally, for uh, allowing us to continue to use um, fossil energy sources where those are abundant. So in the United States, that could be um, natural gas. In, in, in other countries, it could be coal if they have domestic coal. Um, and allow you to, to use those and capture the CO2 uh, and permanently store them uh, without contributing to climate change. The challenge, we've demonstrated carbon capture uh, pretty much at every large scale application. We've done large scale coal fired power plants. We've done um, uh, ethanol facilities, um, cement, uh, steel production, uh, but they're all still at a kind of uh, first of a kind scale. Um, and in order to play a much larger role, we'll need to, um, uh, continue to scale up and, and improve the cost and reduce the technological risk associated with carbon capture systems in a wide range of applications, not just in the power sector, but in industry. Um, and that's going to require, I think, proactive policy support in the near term when these options are way more expensive than other uh, available sources for electricity. And in, in fact, in the United States, we recently enacted and expanded a tax credit called 45Q, which provides up to $50 per ton of carbon captured and stored for um, uh, basically to support early deployment of carbon capture and storage systems in the US. I think that's likely to prompt a lot of new projects over the next uh, five or 10 years. And hopefully will help drive down the cost and risk of these technologies so that they can play a larger role beyond um, the near term. In, in an economy wide net zero context, carbon capture is really indispensable, um, not necessarily in power production, although it would be a nice option to have in power production but primarily in industrial applications like cement, where there's really few options to decarbonize other than using carbon capture. Um, and in bioenergy with CCS, where we can produce either liquid fuels or hydrogen or power um, from biomass, where the carbon in the fuel is absorbed from the atmosphere initially. And then if we can capture the uh, carbon emissions um, in, the, in the conversion process and sequester that, we're actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere via the, the plants absorbing the CO2 and then sequestering it permanently. Um, and that will help draw down emissions. And that negative emissions is really critical um, if we wanna to continue to use any uh, fossil fuels without CCS, like in mobile sources like uh, jet fuel or long distance diesel or pipeline gas for industrial processes, um, uh, which in, a in, our, in our net zero study is sort of the, the least cost way to decarbonize jet fuel is to actually not decarbonize it and to offset emissions from jet fuel um, with uh, negative emissions from bioenergy with CCS. So um, CCS is one of six pillars of a net zero economy that we describe in our net zero America study and um, would be nice to have in the power sector as another option, but is absolutely critical in, in other sectors like uh, fuels production and industry. Um, okay, thank you. So let's move to the next question. So from Professor Peng Jiao, the evaluation of different types of electricity generation should be on a life cycle base. Mm -hmm. 
um, including the cost to maintain and replace materials like turbines and batteries, as well as the upstream cost emission mm -hmm. to produce uh, and recycle the devices. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I, mean, I think you're right. Um, so in our study, we capture the, uh, so in my electricity system studies, we cover the cost uh, of maintenance and replacement uh, explicitly in our modeling. We don't typically cover the upstream emissions, partly because the assumption is this is part of a net zero emissions economy wide transition. So those upstream emissions will be captured in other parts of our modeling that would occur. And indeed in our net zero America study where we cover all industrial um, and energy emission sources, we do capture those um, upstream you know, materials uh, and uh, emissions associated with materials and production, including steel, decarbonizing steel and cement um, uh, and other industrial processes. So as part of a net zero transition, we, can, we, we will be decarbonizing all of those other components as well. Um, the one thing that a lot of studies don't do particularly well, and I think ours doesn't either, is consider recycling of wind and solar. Um, we do include costs for, you know, nuclear fuel storage and, and decommissioning of nuclear power plants, but we don't tend to include the cost of end of life um, recycling for, for turbines and batteries. And that's an area that we could use more data and, and um, research on, and we could include them in our models in the future. Yeah, so uh, let's move to the last question for today's seminar. Uh, how do the CO2 savings attainable from decarbonization of the industrial process? such mm -hmm. as steel and cement manufacturer compared to those from the power generation sector? Yeah, great question. Uh, in the US context, at least, um, basically transportation is the greatest source of emissions in the, in the US now, um, but industry and electric electricity next and then industry after that are, are pretty close. So all three of them are fairly similar size um, between 20 and 30% of our overall CO2 emissions. Um, and so the, and in the industrial sector, the big ones are steel, cement, and petrochemicals. Um, and so we need to find ways to decarbonize those sectors as well. And in our Net Zero America study, we focus primarily on um, carbon capture for cement and uh, direct reduction of iron with hydrogen for steel production. This could be a very large consumer of uh, hydrogen, um, which is to basically, instead of reducing steel with, um, with carbon uh, in, um, in you know, um, coking coal, uh, we would reduce it with, uh, directly with hydrogen. And this is a process that's already done in some contexts. I think in, in Abu Dhabi um, or the UAE, there's a steel plant right now that uses natural gas, um, produces hydrogen, and then uses that for, for direct reduction iron. Um, and then we can use electric arc furnaces to convert that iron into um, steel. So it's a very energy intensive process, but here's where the exergenic efficiency and carbon you know, don't necessarily align, right? So the carbon content of those fuels is, is zero. We're using clean electricity to produce hydrogen. We're using clean electricity for, for electric arc or furnaces. Um, and so in a zero carbon, you know, net zero emissions context, that's okay if it uses a lot more energy, as long as it displaces um, uh, carbon emissions from, from coking steel. So or cooking coal. Uh, so it, just to, for context, I'm, I'm involved in a study right now for Sweden, where Sweden's uh, major steel producer has vowed to, um, to convert to carbon neutral um, or net zero emissions uh, by 2040, I believe. Um, and the hydrogen demand that would be required to do DRI steel, direct reduction iron for all of their steel production, uh, by 2040, it would be about 20% of all national electricity demand. So it's a huge amount of energy needed. Okay. Um, but that's an option we can do. Uh -huh. And okay. it, that's what we're exploring right yeah. now. Yeah, it has been long. And thank you so much for spending uh, so much time with us uh, on a Saturday morning. Thank yeah. you again. Thanks everybody.